to Calvary Church this morning. It's the first Sunday in Advent, and we are going to start uh, remembering the coming of Jesus Christ now. So to get us started, uh, Pastor Heather is going to introduce the themes of Advent. We're going to light candles, hear the bells, and uh, welcome to church this morning. is Waiting for Jesus, the Light of the World. And this is the first Sunday of Advent, and our theme this week is hope. Waiting for Jesus, the Light of Hope. And each Sunday of Advent, we will, we will light one Advent candle. And then on Christmas morning, we will light all of the candles, including the Christ candle. And the purpose of lighting these candles is to be reminded, to remember that Jesus is the light of the world and that Jesus came to be with us, Emmanuel, God with us. And as we spend time this Advent anticipating Jesus coming again, this, this time of Advent, it's also a time to remember and to think about why is it that Jesus needed to come? So this is a time to reflect on our own need for Christ. Why is it that Jesus needed to enter the world? What was going on in the world? What the brokenness of the world, the brokenness of our own hearts. So this is a, a time of, of waiting, of anticipation, and reflection. Waiting for Jesus, the light of the world. Waiting for Jesus, the light of hope. this first Sunday of Advent, we light the candle of hope. Hope is our assurance that God will finish all he has started. Hope is our confidence that he will do all he has promised. All the promises of God are fulfilled in Jesus Christ. He is our hope today and forever. Thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. Well, good morning, everyone, and we're going to sing this song that we just heard, so if you're able, you please stand and let's sing Angels from the Realms of Glory.
know, I was just reading this morning in scripture, uh, it says in the Psalms, this is the day the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. And then just as we were praying up front, uh, one, of the, one of the partners here prayed that exact scripture. And some of you today may think, wait a minute, this is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice in this day, this day when surgery, I'm facing surgery, or I'm facing sickness, or whatever the problems are. Well, God calls us to rejoice and to fix our eyes on Him because there's much joy in Him. And so this song, Hosanna, hope is stirring, hearts are yearning for you, because when we see you, we find strength to face the day. That's what our hope is in. That's what our joy is in.
praise the Lord. Let's take a moment. And let's say hello to each other. Let's greet each other in the name of the Lord. Hey, John. Hey, good morning. Hey, just a couple of quick announcements here for you before uh, we kind of keep moving here. Uh, and some of these things are in your bulletin, so don't worry if you missed anything, you can sort of catch it. I'm holding the bulletin wrong, but maybe you noticed the art this morning thank you you can thank the children of our church they've submitted artwork and those will be on display in, in other places as well if you still want to get in on that kids and up to high school youth you can submit your stuff still it'll still be put out there so thanks to them for helping uh, celebrate the season or kick it off well uh, other things the year-end drive uh, there's a also an announcement in the bulletin about if you have any questions at all and you haven't had a chance to ask me or anyone else like finance uh, team at all uh, you can meet after the service let's just hang out right in the back I know it says up front but the Sunday school kids will be up here practicing their Christmas program so meet in the back or find me there and we'll figure out a great place to sit if you have questions um, and just here in general not just year-end drive specific uh, items but building um, sort of updates in general sort of what's been going on what's coming uh, near and also far out so sort of a bigger scope thing. Uh, the other thing happening right after the service that I encourage you to go to is an adult ed, uh, sort of timing of this Advent season beginning now. Uh, Brendan is gonna be leading another adult ed class on the incarnation and sort of, uh, as a Christian, what does that mean? The importance of that, how that all ties in. Yeah, Brendan's right there. And uh, so he's gonna be offering uh, three weeks about the incarnation, so. Check that out afterwards, uh, soon after, so mill about, get coffee or whatever, and then go to the lounge right down the hallway here to the left. Let's see here. Yeah, I'm going to bring up, uh, no, tonight, uh, 5 o'clock, we have an evening service. That is a shared one Wyoming uh, service. Not here. It's at the House of Prayer. That is also in your bulletin. You can sort of look up the, uh, the address for that if you don't know where that is. And I'm going to bring up Dale Elder's John House Camp to come up and uh, share a little update about some cool news. Yeah, so we were asked a while ago to uh, be a sponsoring church for Alan Pontarelli and the Southwest Community Church. And we as a council uh, talked, discussed, met with Alan several times. Uh, Pastor Mark met with Alan for almost six months and kind of mentored Alan. And at the end of the day, um, we said, yeah, this is a great thing. We need to be the sponsoring church for Allen and Southwest Community Church. So uh, the council agreed to that. And two weeks ago now, Allen uh, was here, and we had a special classes meeting, and he did a phenomenal job. Um, I'd never been to one of these uh, types of special meetings before, but uh, I was blown away. So he did a phenomenal job uh, at the end of the night he was anonymously or unanimously he was approved <laughs> and uh, with nobody questioning so Alan's church um, that he's been ministering to for about 10 years now is in the Black Hills and the Roosevelt Park area um, they're going to meet in Potter's house um, for the short term or for their initial term and uh, minister of that neighborhood that he has a super passion for. Um, so he graduated from seminary uh, last year. He obviously was approved um, by classes to be an ordained uh, minister. And his ordi ordination will be held uh, next week, Sunday at 4 o'clock in the Black Hills Community Center. And would like to invite anybody that's available to participate and show the support from Calvary to Allen. 
Um, we feel there's a great synergy between Allen, Southwest Community Church, and what we're doing here at Calvary. So uh, we want to become a great partner to Allen, and Allen a great partner to us, because I think we have both uh, things that we can bring to each other. So we'll get to know Allen um, in the upcoming new year. Um, he's busy trying to get his end of year stuff taken care of and kind of plan what the new year's looks like, but we've particip we want to participate jointly um, with Allen and Southwest and for vice versa with Allen participating with Calvary. So if you have any questions, you can talk to a council member, Mark, Heather, um, and we'll look forward to getting to know Allen and the Southwest Community Church in the new year. So, awesome. Thanks. Thank you. I had the joy of participating in Alan's um, previous exam before ordination, and then um, Pastor Moles got to know him too a little bit. It's just been amazing to see the synergy that happens when churches do work together. And I'll just highlight that thing this evening too at uh, House of Prayer, Casa de Oración. It's a one way omen. A bunch of churches coming together. And God truly moves when we see that we're not uh, separate, but we're one church. Um, many different branches, many different spots, but we're one church. Um, at this point, we're going to uh, have a chance to give our offerings, and I'm going to let uh, kids go to children's worship, but even while you're going that, I'm gonna just going to pray uh, for us as we give our offerings and as we continue to worship, and kids can go out to children's worship as I do that. Father, we thank you for your mercy. We thank you for your grace. In this Advent season, as we remember the story of Christmas, we thank you for the fact that you sent your son, Jesus Christ, your very self, into the world so that we might have life. We thank you that you do things in ways that we don't expect on a continual basis. We thank you that somehow in your mysterious providence you sent a baby into the world to change the entire world. And today we're just grateful and we, we live in the knowledge that Jesus Christ is not only a gift to us as a baby, but he's our Lord and Savior. And so we ask Lord, how we might give our gifts to you, whether it's talent, whether it's time, or whether it's actual finances, Lord, we ask. And we submit to your will in our lives, Lord, and we ask that you guide us forward, show us how to give our lives to you, and show us how to receive life from you so that we choose life and not anything else, Lord. We thank you for your mercy, and, and we pray that your will will be done in our lives here in this place and uh, wherever we may go. In Jesus' name, amen.
have the opportunity to go to God in prayer. A couple of updates. Dolores Poli, Poli, Poli. Dolores Poli, a member of this community, had a stroke this weekend, and she is in Metro, and she's unconscious. And it's a heartbreaking situation, and the family is um, needing wisdom and discernment and unsure what to do, what the next steps are. Pastor Mark was there last night, and, and she was still unconscious at that time. So we will be praying for, for Dolores and her, her family. And Jackson Wall, I um, was with uh, John and Donna last night. I saw them, and this situation, um, Jackson is still in the U.S. So um, for the moment, he's, he was to go to Detroit and then be um, transported to South Sudan, but then they sent him to Arizona, and in Arizona he didn't have the right paperwork, and so now he's in Indiana in a holding pattern to go back to Ohio. And it's unclear what's going to happen next, but in talking with Donna, as she talks to Mary, Jackson's grandmother, and, and just telling the story, there's a profound amount of peace in the situation. Jackson is at peace, whether he stays here or whether he has to go back to South Sudan. And, and Mary, um, his grandmother, um, she has a testimony, a track record with Jesus of what he did in her life and bringing her here. And she proclaims his faith, the presence of his hand in her life. And, and she communicates that to Jackson and Jackson is sharing that, that, that God's got Jackson, wherever, whichever state he's in, and, and if he has to go back. And we can trust that. And so it, it's a, such a blessing that this young man who is being bounced around can rest in, in knowing that Jesus has him. So we will pray for him because he's heavy on so many of our hearts. But we can pray for him with a confidence and a hope for what is to come for him, that his future has good things no matter where he is. Let's go to God in prayer. Father God, we come to you in prayer because you are a God who cares. You invite our prayers. You invite us to come to you and, and praise you and confess our sins and and to bring to you those things that are heavy on our hearts. Thank you. Thank you that you are a God who sees us and you care about every detail, big or small. You care about the details we're willing to name. You care about the things that stay hidden. You care about it all. Thank you. And so now as a community, God, we come to you with those things that are on our hearts that we collectively want to lift our voices and our hearts and our minds and our souls to you in prayer because you are a God of, of power and abundance and compassion and blessing. You are a God who listens and you are a God who moves. And so we, we come to you in prayer this morning and we pray for Jackson. We thank you and praise you that he exists, that he is your child, that you love him. We thank you that he is in your hand. And we don't know what his future is, but we know that you've got him. And so we pray for him, Lord. We, we praise you for the peace that transcends understanding. And we pray that you will lead and guide him. We pray for favor in the eyes of those who are making decisions about his life. And we pray, Jesus, light of hope, shine light in the areas of darkness in Jackson's life. Bring light and life and hope in his world, Lord. And God, we pray for refugees and immigrants and dreamers and undocumented workers. 
Muslims, and all who call U.S. home. People who find themselves wondering whether they will still have a home in the near future, given the current climate of our country and the political atmosphere and all of the fear and the decisions that are being made, made right now. We pray for all of those peoples, Lord. Jesus, light of hope, shine light in their world. Shine light. God, we lift up people in our community who need your hand of healing. We pray for Dolores. Lord, we pray that you would bring your healing hand and touch her body. Deliver her through these circumstances, whatever, you, whatever way you see fit, Lord. Bring healing and peace to her. And we pray for wisdom and discernment for her family who is in this terrible situation of having to make decisions about their loved one who is unconscious. So hard. Lord, have compassion and mercy and shine light. Shine light on their path. Show them the way, Lord. And comfort them. Comfort that family. Lord, we pray for Roger and Marsha Lamer and, and Rob and Carol. We pray for comfort for them. We pray for their daughter, Tess, as she receives this diagnosis of breast cancer. Lord, we pray by the power of the Holy Spirit and in the name of Jesus that you would heal Tess, that you would deliver her from cancer, bring healing to her, and Lord, we pray that you indeed shine the light of hope in all of their lives as they journey through this cancer path again. Lord, be the lifter of their heads. And Lord, we pray for your healing hand in the lives of Bill Heising and Karen Frank and, and for Pastor George and so many others who need your physical healing hand on their body. Come, Lord Jesus, come. And Lord, we lift up people with migraines and people who struggle with IBS and arthritis and anxiety, depression, chronic fatigue syndrome, severe colds and aches and pains that accompany aging, including dementia and their caregivers. Things that we don't ordinarily pray for out loud in church, but yet things that affect our lives in a daily, real way. You are a God who sees and cares, and so we pray for all of these things, Lord. Jesus, light of hope, shine your light in our worlds, be the lifter of our heads, and bring healing. God, we pray for those who need homes and jobs, more income, for people who need purpose and passion, a calling and clarity. Jesus, light of hope, shine in the darkness. And now, as we prepare to open your holy word and be fed by the food of your living word, as we prepare to hear how your Holy Spirit intersected the life of your servant Mary, we pray that your Holy Spirit will intersect our lives as we hear from you in this moment. We thank you for how you have been speaking to Pastor Mark this week as he's prepared to speak to us. We pray that we will hear your voice through his voice. We pray that you give him an anointing of your Holy Spirit that he will proclaim your word clearly and boldly with compassion. Lord, we want to hear from you this morning. Give us ears to hear. In the name of Jesus, by the power of your Holy Spirit, we are eager for what you will do and say. We love you, and we thank you that you hear our prayers. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
I'd like to invite you to turn to open your Bible to Luke chapter 1, which is on page 1070. Many of you have heard this story a few times before, but it's always amazing and intriguing to look into it and discover there's something that you never saw before. And I pray that um, the familiar truths speak to you this morning, as well as something that you may not have seen before. I'm going to start by reading this passage. I want to invite you to read it along with me. And at the end, even though it's not on the screen, I'll say the word of the Lord, and you can say, thanks be to God. Luke chapter 1, verse 26. In the sixth month, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. That virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will be with child and give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom will never end. How can this be? Mary asked the angel, since I am a virgin. The angel answered, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you, so the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age, and she who is said to be barren is in her sixth month. For nothing is impossible with God. I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May it be to me as you have said. Then the angel left her. This is the word of the Lord. I think for me and many of us, Christmas is about remembering great things. Obviously the message of Jesus. That's why we celebrate Advent. That's why we have more than just one Christmas celebration. We have Advent. A whole season of remembering the message of Jesus come as a child. Eventually will be our Lord and Savior, die on the cross, rise again so that we can have life. So we can do things like come to church and live in safety and have functional families and choose right and not wrong. We remember the birth and the gift of Jesus Christ. We do that in so many wonderful ways. I think my favorite ornament that we dug out of the box this year, I haven't even seen it yet, but my kids did this. It's a little uh, red string that I wrapped around a balloon when I was about in third or fourth grade, and there's glitter on it. And I just was so proud of it back then. And since my craft skills have never really progressed beyond that stage, I'm still proud of it. I think it's wonderful. And uh, we all have these traditions where we pull out these ornaments and trees and tinsel and we kind of remember it from last year. And then after the ornaments and the trees come out, the recipe cards come out, right? And we want to make things we only make once a year. And it really is the most wonderful time of the year, even though it gets cold outside and all that. It's wonderful. Uh, we also remember other things at Christmas time, and, and these things come a little bit less um, welcome, but we remember loss, right? We remember people that aren't in our lives anymore. A year ago, our own family was going through loss, and those people are no longer in our lives. And when Christmas comes, and maybe we don't have our kids, or don't have our spouse anymore, or don't have what we used to have, we also sort of remember that fact, too. However you put it, though, Christmas is a wonderful time or a painful time of remembering. But what I want to bring out this morning is that in Scripture, the way this story is told, it's not really told the first way to help people remember. It's told and designed and told in such a way that it's written so that people, and it happened, that's what I'm trying to say, it happened and it's written so that people who have never heard of the story before find a way to identify with this story and suddenly and immediately find themselves in the middle of this story. And I've talked about this in previous years. These all these characters that are part of the story. The shepherds, right? The poor people on the edge of society, the wise men, the magi, the sorcerers, even from far east, maybe Persia, who aren't Christian, who aren't God-fearers at all, uh, come. So then if you're one of those people, you can find yourself in this story. The devout people in the temple, Anna and Simeon, they find themselves in the story. And even the Pharisees and the rabbis find themselves in the story, first resisting and then perhaps eventually toward the end of Jesus' life, coming to faith in him. There's so much room to find yourself in the story. And because this story is about Mary and an angel and the promised child, we're going to focus on how a young woman who's betrothed to be married finds themselves in this, finds herself, themselves, however you say that, in this story. 
Uh, so I was reading uh, NPR. I don't usually go on NPR. I'm against it. I just don't usually get on that site. But I happened to be on that site this, uh, this week and found a story uh, that received a prize. Uh, and it's really a prize about a, um, a lady who went to northern India and took pictures of young women, uh, young girls really there in northern India in a small village. This is just a delightful picture, I think. It was on the cover of a magazine, that's why there's that thing on the side. But just a delightful picture of a 12, 13-year-old girl in some, a crop, maybe is that, I can't tell what that is. Um, and she's just having a great time being a young girl, right? Here's another picture of another young girl in front of her house, uh, dressed in the, I don't know if it's typical, but it certainly is what I think of as typical, the beautiful colors uh, in front of her house, kind of poor, but yet she's with family and just the incredible fabrics that they make daily use of there is just always inspiring to me. Uh, what you don't know about these two young girls is that they're both betrothed to be married. They're both promised in marriage to a young man who's slightly older and they're both essentially exactly in the same situation that Mary found herself in in this passage. Uh, perhaps you think, most of us heard this before, Mary was more than likely not 18 or 21, right? She didn't just choose to, to be married to, she's more than likely a young woman. 15, 16, she could have been as young as 12 or even 10. Some of these uh, young girls uh, are betrothed to be married and actually are married when they're 10 or 11 or 12. And it's not usually to older people in this village, it's someone just a little bit older. And uh, that's their situation. We're about as far as distant from the situation that Mary was in in the small town of Nazareth as we are from these girls who are up in the northern part of India. We're here in this culture because we've been informed by centuries, even uh, 2,000 years of information about how to live as followers of Jesus Christ. But this is where it starts. And this message is designed for people like this who never have heard anything about the message of Jesus. Imagine a young girl reading this for the first time and all of a sudden she finds herself in this story. Here's a few more pictures I'll show you. This is uh, close to the wedding. This is the wedding day celebration. And again, the beauty of it. But look at the face of that young girl if you can see it. She's not exactly bubbling over with joy. There's an older guy on the left-hand side. The lights might be too bright to see it. But he's kind of laughing. He's just having a good time. It's a celebration. Um, but she herself is not that excited because she has no idea what's next and she has no power over her life. This is a picture that really got me, and this is the, probably the picture of why I'm, I brought it up as an illustration. This young girl is sitting there, it's her wedding day, uh, she doesn't look terribly excited. And the photographer asked her, so, uh, you know, what are you thinking? What hopes and dreams do you have? Do you wish that this could be another way? And she said, there is no choice for me. This must happen. It's okay, because it must happen, and I have no other choice. This has to be. Uh, she has no choice. So, I think what I want to focus on is the powerlessness of a young girl who's betrothed to be married. It might be a good situation. It might be a situation like for this girl where she's not at all interested in, but yet it's going to happen anyway. But it certainly is a powerless situation. And God designs his story in such a way that, yes, we all can relate to it, but he designs it in such a way, he lets it happen in such a way, that people all over the world who find themselves in this exact situation can immediately find themselves in the middle of this story. And find hope, I believe. So we're going to go through this passage. Uh, just And I didn't, put the, I didn't put the scripture on the screen because I, I want you to see this picture and be able to refer back to it. But you have a Bible in front of you. You can open it if you want. I'm just going to go through this passage uh, sort of section by section. The first section is, of course, just the place. And the story does a great job of that. In the sixth month, God sent the angel Gabriel, one of two angels named in Scripture, to Nazareth, the town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, descendant of David. So it's an obscure area. There's nothing much going on there. The only hint that you have that something extraordinary is going to happen is that Joseph is a descendant of David. And there's a virgin, but now you finally hear her name. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, sort of the standard greeting uh, that angels say to people, uh, Greetings, you are highly favored. That's maybe new. And then the Lord is with you, right? So it's this big greeting, uh, powerful angel, messenger angel, and Mary's a young virgin. And she's just overwhelmed, of course. She was greatly troubled, wondered what this might be. But the angel said to her, what angels always say to people, right? What do angels always say? Don't be afraid, right? Because angels are... Uh, terrifying, inducing uh, spiritual beings. Don't be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. And what favor 
she had gone, I wonder, you know, I wonder if Gabriel was sent from God and kind of just thought to himself, why is this one girl here in this one uh, town of Nazareth? I wonder if he thought that and just wondered, even as you said that, for some reason you have found favor with God. And here is, here is the message. You will be with child and give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High God. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will raise, reign over the house of Jacob forever. His kingdom will never end. So from powerlessness, from as far away from the throne as possible, to the actual son of her sitting on the throne. At this point, she doesn't know it's going to be a virgin birth. She doesn't know anything about that. All she knows is she's going to have a son someday, and this son is going to sit on the throne. I was going to get a throne and put it on here, the bells. I thought, you know, that's just going to be distracting. It's going to hurt the bells. We don't want to do that. But it's from poverty to the throne. Absolute powerlessness to the very seat of power. It's not her, but her son. And, you know, speaking of having kids, this girl, Mary, and this girl here, both knew that they were going to have kids. That's just what happened. Either you had kids and lived through it, and things went well, or you didn't. But either way, you were going to have children. She knows that she's going to have kids. What she doesn't know is that one of her kids, the firstborn, is going to be the son of God. That's the mind-blowing thing. She knows she doesn't have a choice. She knows she's going to be a marriage. She knows she's going to be forced to take care of and raise kids, whether she likes it or not, whether she's trained for it or not, whether she has other hopes and dreams or not. That's what's going to happen. But now God is saying to her, your firstborn son is going to be the son of the Most High God. He will sit on the throne of David, and his kingdom will last forever. So it's not even so much changing what's going to happen. It's, it's fulfilling, and it's making something even more amazing out of what she already knows is going to happen. There's only one uh, problem, and Mary knows a little bit about biology. Not, uh, you know, every kid gets taught this, but she knows, and she says, uh, "So, Angel, there's only one problem. I'm a bird. That's not going to be biologically possible." And in this context, it seems that she knows she's not going to be with Joseph for quite some time because she's betrothed and not actually married. And she says, "How is this going to be possible? Because that's just not biologically possible." And then the, angel, then the angel says this, and this is the new news. Mary doesn't know this until this point, until the angel tells her. The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you, so the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. See what? You're going to get pregnant by God. That's, uh, that's kind of weird. That's kind of odd. As you look at this passage, um, there's something that I don't think gets talked about a lot, probably, probably for good reason. This passage and this, uh, the wording in this passage is not sexual. I mean, people do commentaries on This is not, none of these words that are used in this passage are used for the way a man is with a woman. There's nothing uh, corollary about that. This is not um, the same thing. But the words the power of the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the Most High God will overshadow you, they are strangely reminiscent of the fact that a woman is submissive in a relationship to a man, especially when it comes to making a child. It's similar. There are, in fact, certain things that a woman knows about being in a relationship with God that a man will never fully understand because a woman is submissive, especially when it comes to making children. That's just an element to that that you can't get away from. I'm not going to dwell on this because it's awkward and it's kind of weird, but it is true. So here the situation is, Mary is sitting here going, okay, I know I'm going to have to, have to be submissive to my husband, but here's this greater submission somehow that I'm going to be, have to be submissive to God. And she had a choice in some sense of the word to say, no thank you, or I am willing to submit. We know at the end she says she's willing to submit. But here's, I think here is the, uh, the, the insight for me that I never really had seen before. Whether Mary felt powerless or whether she was super excited to be married, for, married to Joseph, she has to submit to the will that has been determined by her culture, and she will be married to Joseph. She will have kids, whether she likes it or not. There is no out. In the same way, this girl was now married to some guy, and she is in that situation, whether uh, she likes it or not. 
So in these situations that involve difficulty, that involves not choosing your own destiny, how does God often act in terms of bringing deliverance and bringing hope and bringing freedom? And you notice this. This is a, this is a key point. God doesn't come into the situation and say, Mary, I'm going to set you free. You get to go off to rabbinical school and be a rabbi and do all sorts of things that no young girl has ever done. He actually invites her into more submission. See that? She's not only going to be submissive to her husband, she's going to be submissive to God. And I think there's a stunning, uh, massive, incredible insight in this situation. Because if you think about each one of our lives, when we have to deal with difficult stuff, whether it's sickness or job difficulties or personal addictions or health issues or opportunity to get through school and then get a job, there's always things that we have to submit ourselves to that are just plain old difficult and we'd rather would not submit ourselves to them. And God doesn't come into our lives and say, hey, you know what, that's all right, you don't have to deal with that anymore. He doesn't often do that, although sometimes he does. More often than not, he comes into our lives and actually invites us to submit to yet something else. Maybe obedience. Maybe an actual relationship with God that we have been avoiding for quite some time. Often when we're in difficulty, God, in fact, invites us to submit to something else. Not being pregnant with Jesus, of course, but this is a pattern that God does on a regular basis. If we want to experience freedom, God often invites us to, mit, to submit to yet another thing in our lives. Isn't that odd? And then in the middle of that situation, God uses the next thing that we submit ourselves to, to bring ourselves out of that difficulty and into new, into new freedom and fulfillment. And here the pattern is with Mary. And so, yes, she does end up getting married to Joseph, and she does end up experiencing um, that type of a relationship with Joseph. But at the end of this passage, she submits to God, too. And because of that, she goes to marry the young virgin, to marry the mother of Jesus. To marry the mother of Jesus who followed Jesus around and helped and supported him. To marry the mother of Jesus that saw him and truly understood who he was after the crucifixion, the Lord of all heaven and earth. That's how this stuff works. And in this situation, I want to ask you, because this, uh, this is, I think, where the rubber hits the road, so to speak. Is there stuff in your life that you don't want to submit to because it's just not pleasant, it might not even be the way the world is created to be? And you resist it, you resist it, you fight against it, you fight against it. And it's not that that thing is from God and that God just is asking you to submit to that and that's just the way it is and you just have to deal with it. But often in the midst of our struggle, what God is waiting for us to do is actually submit ourselves to His will and allow His will to be done in our life. That's what God invites us to do time and time and time again. A long time ago, a young man who was struggling with his faith asked me, you know, who are you to just uh, come up to people and tell them what to believe and how to live? And I, I thought to myself for a little bit and I said to him, I, I don't ever do that. I don't ever go up to people and say, hey, this is what you ought to believe, this is what you ought to do, and this is the way you ought to live, and why? Because life is, is far more difficult and far more uh, involved and far more filled with details than those kind of conversations can really ever facilitate. We all have difficult struggles, we all have different things that we're dealing with, and yes, Jesus Christ is Lord of our lives and He wants to come in, but the actual interplay between what Jesus is asking us to do and the ways He's asking us to submit are far more complicated than simple answers that we can just sort of spew out and uh, force fit in other people's lives. There are always so many things in the details of our lives that God is inviting us to submit to Him, and out of that beauty, He will then bring answers to prayer that we never saw coming. And that is the, uh, that's really the final point that I want to say. Mary had a situation, whether she was happy about it or not, that was going to happen. And she really saw probably one or two ways out of this, and the one main way was to get married. And the other main way was for the marriage to break off, and that wouldn't have been good for either because of the social context. And that is how we live life, right? We, we have these difficult situations, we know about God, we know about Jesus, and we can often think of one or two ways that they could work out. Maybe this way or that way. Maybe I get the job or I don't or I get that other job or maybe someone gets me a job or maybe I get better or maybe I get some relief from my pain or maybe the doctors do this. But often um, what God actually has in mind is a completely different way that we never saw it coming. 
And that's what happens in the story with Jesus, right? Jesus is born by the power of the Holy Spirit. He's born into her life, and things happen that she never, that she never saw coming. And God doesn't always do a miracle like that. But often what happens when we submit ourselves to God, He has something in mind that we didn't ever see coming. We have communion this morning. And it's actually a, quite a remarkable opportunity. It's a spiritual analogy, not a physical analogy. The spiritual analogy is we actually have an, an opportunity to invite Jesus Christ, not just into our lives, but into the details of our life. There's no angel here speaking directly to you. There's probably angels here, but there's no angels here speaking directly to you, saying this is what's going to happen to you. But the Word of God is speaking to you and saying, if you want Jesus in your life, if you want Jesus in the midst of whatever difficult situation you're dealing with, all you have to do is say yes. Say yes. At the end of this passage, there's a beautiful phrase. I think it put it on the screen here, too. For no word from God will ever fail. It's, it's a bit of a complicated Greek sentence. In your Bible in front of you, it says, nothing is impossible with God. This might be a better translation. No word from God will ever fail. It's referring to the story of Elizabeth. Also, interestingly, it's not just about young women, it's about old women too, and wounds being open, uh, regardless of how old these people are. This passage says, no word from God will ever fail. And Mary says, she could have said anything, she said, said something like Zachariah, like, I don't really believe that, can you show me a sign? But she said, I am the Lord's servant. May your word to me be fulfilled. She's ready. She's waiting. She has no idea what's going to happen in the future as she'll find out as she walks that out with God. But she's willing. and She's obedient. Because of that, she experiences the life that God has for her. So I have a couple questions as we close. Uh, some of us are here. We're just amazed that God has worked in our lives. We're at a time of blessing. Things are really good. And that's something to be grateful for. We don't have to apologize for having decades, centuries, or even a year or two of Christianity in our family, in our context, in our culture. That's something to celebrate. It's something to celebrate God's blessings in our lives. It's just amazing and it's wonderful and it's beautiful and it's something to thank God for. So if that's the case, thank God, enjoy Christmas season, don't buy too much junk, and just enjoy life that God has given you. But, but, if you're in a situation like these young people, if you're in a situation of health, where you don't know what the future involves. So you're in a situation where your family is dealing with difficulty, you have no idea what they're dealing with or how they're going to get through it. If you have kids that are wandering far, if you have parents that really don't seem to care much about you, maybe don't believe. The question is this. The question is this. Are you willing to live in that and ask God, how can you submit to Him in the middle of that? If you ask God, God, how can I submit to you? More than likely, there's going to be details that He gives you that you've never thought of before. Maybe the different kind of conversation, maybe the time in prayer, maybe an answer, maybe another doctor. Maybe it's just peace from God and removal of all anxiety. So you put whatever needs to be in God's court in God's court, and you only try to do what you yourself are called to do. And finally, maybe there's another way. Maybe you're stuck in your thinking. Maybe there's another way. Maybe you're thinking, oh, there's this way, or there's that way, or there's this thing, or there's that thing. But actually, as you submit to God and allow Him to be the Lord of your life, maybe there's, maybe there's another way. And we don't know it, we can't think of it, but maybe, maybe there's another way. There always is with God. The candle that we lit this morning is hope. And it's really struck me in the last, uh, oh, I don't know, two or three weeks, that we don't have hope because of theology. We don't have hope because we know that God's going to come back someday. Just now, we have hope because of a person in Jesus Christ. And Mary actually got the whole of the baby Jesus in her arms and watched him grow up. And somewhere along the line, she realized that this was a special child. This wasn't, in fact, God himself. And we don't have that opportunity to hold Jesus as a baby, but we do have an opportunity to have a relationship with Jesus. And it's not because of theology. It's not because of church per se. It's not because of all that that we have hope. It's not because we have Christmas ornaments and Christmas trees and music at the mall. It's because of Jesus Christ as a real person, a real God. He's willing to actually walk with us in our lives and interact with us. That's why we have hope. And on that hope, I want to pray.
and transition us into communion. Father God, we thank you for who you are. We thank you for the gift of Jesus given for us. We thank you for the gift of remembering. But we thank you that you designed this story in such a way that people all over the world who have never heard your message before can immediately find themselves in the story and go, you know what? Maybe it can be true for me too. And I pray that you be with the world today. There are just millions, even billions of people who are living in abject poverty, who have no resource, who have no recourse with the government, who have no control of their own lives, Lord. And I pray that you somehow, by your miraculous power, would reveal to them the story and the message of salvation is only you can do. But I pray that you be with us here today. We, because we are people, are dealing with difficulty. We, because we are, we are people, need your grace in our lives. We, because we are people, long to be filled with your presence so we can experience things that we never have experienced before. So as we submit to you, I pray that you would work in our lives and that you would come into our lives. And we lift all this up to you and pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. We have just heard the word proclaimed audibly. Sometimes this table is referred to as the visual word, the physical word. So as we have just taken in the word of the Lord through our ears, we now have the opportunity to take in the word of the Lord through our bodies. This is not a an exclusive table. This is a generous table in that the Lord invites us to come to this table, to receive his grace, to be fed at this table. If you can proclaim that you love the Lord, that you are a person that needs Jesus and acknowledge him as your savior, that you desire to grow in your relationship with him, that you desire to live a life of obedience, you are invited to this table, regardless of age or circumstance, regardless of your past or your current situation, the Lord generously invites you to come to his table. On the night he was betrayed, Jesus sat around a table with his disciples, sharing a last meal together. And he said some unusual words that we repeat and have been repeating for thousands of years. We've taken them into our culture, our tradition, as meaningful words. He said, he took the bread, and after he had given thanks, he broke it. And he said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in memory of me. In the same way, after dinner, he took the cup and he said, this is the new covenant in my blood. Do this in memory of me. words we say about this as part of our tradition are these that whenever we eat the bread and drink the cup we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again in other words we proclaim that Jesus Christ was born and in that birth we have hope that he died for us 
And one day, he will come again. These are the gifts of God for you, the people of God. Gifts he gives us to nurture our faith and draw us to himself.
and believe that the body of our Lord Jesus Christ was given for a complete forgiveness of all your sins.
for a complete forgiveness of all your sins. The psalmist responds in praise with these words. Praise the Lord, my soul, and all that is within me. Praise his holy name. Praise the Lord, my soul, and forget not his benefits, who forgives all your sins and heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit and crowns you with love and compassion, who satisfies your desires with good things, so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. Praise the Lord, my soul. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you and praise you for your good gifts, and we thank you and praise you for your spiritual gift of nurture and love and compassion and hope through this celebration feast, Holy Communion. And we pray that you nurture us and you nurture our faith this day and this week and this month and every day that follows. Draw us deeper and deeper in relationship to you. That every day our souls may be able to say, praise the Lord, my soul. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's stand and respond together by singing, Only a God Like You.
seven season, God's going to let you experience some regular things, some things you remember from years past, some things that are familiar to the Sabbath season. It's also going to be unexpected, hopefully wonderful things, perhaps not so wonderful. Whatever they are, I want to invite you to invite God into those moments. And if you want prayer right now for some of that, that stuff, I'd like to invite you to come forward. Prayer cards are around. There's a basket back there. I want to invite you to invite people in your life to pray with you. As you go, may you receive the blessing of God. May the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May the Lord overshadow you. And may the Lord fill you and fill you with all of his presence. May you go in knowing the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of our God the Father. May you experience him always in every moment as long as you live. In Jesus' name, go in peace.